Narodna banka published yet another optimistic report about projected economic growth in Macedonia. Mind you, with each report, the projected growth goes down from 4 or in something percent, then to 3.5 percent, then to 3.2 percent. But hey, growth is growth. And in the current global, interna- global economic environment, to achieve any kind of growth is possibly perceived as an achievement. At any rate, we measure economic growth via changes in a statistic called gross domestic product, or GDP. GDP is a commonly used, though hotly disputed, measure of economic health, of the state of the economy in general, as well as the prosperity of individual citizens, firms and other entities in the economy. Gross domestic product is a combination of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. But like everything else in economics, there are several problems with this measure. First of all, there are three known methodologies to calculate GDP, and each methodology uses two alternative formulas. To summarize, there are six ways to measure GDP, and none of them gives the same result like the other. So governments can be choosy and picky and decide which way to use when in order to yield the best result. A perfect example of such manipulation of figures under political pressure is, of course, Greece. Greece falsified its GDP figures for many years, increasing them artificially by more than 15, maybe 20%. So, GDP figures are suspect to begin with. They they are easily, can be easily manipulated, and there are various ways to do that. Actually, when I applied certain rigorous methodologies to the GDP of Macedonia, I discovered that the growth, the real growth, is possibly between 1.8% and 2.2%, and not 35 to 4%, as the government claims. What ways are there to manipulate GDP? How can we massage the figures to get the right results? Well, first of all, as you remember, government spending is part of GDP. Amazingly, the higher government spending, the higher the GDP. So a government that increases public spending, for instance, on construction projects, would automatically increase the GDP. Yes, you heard me correctly. These monuments in the Plostat are part and parcel of the GDP a main engine and driver of so-called economic growth. But this is only one of the problems and the more visible one. There are other ways under the hood of manipulating GDP. For example, you can change the way industrial production is calculated and that way influence GDP figures. Another example, you can include in GDP as a government, you can include in the GDP figures products that are manufactured but not yet sold. We call these goods in inventory. A rise in inventories, a rise in unsold products, is a sign of bad economic health. It's a sign of a deteriorating economy. But paradoxically, it, is, it also increases GDP. Then there is the issue of goods and products manufactured with credits and loans. The more Credit is available in the economy, the more it is used to produce goods and other products, the more, the higher the GDP. So in an economy that is fueled by credits, artificially or integrally, GDP goes up automatically, even though someday this money has to be paid back. And then there's the issue of investment, including, by the way, foreign direct investment. Some governments count promises to invest, commitments to invest, and intentions to invest as ready-made investments. In other words, if the government receives a promise to invest $200 million, GDP goes up automatically by $200 million, although that's only a promise. Nothing has been invested. And if an investment does happen, it might happen over many years, or it might not happen at all. So, in some methodologies, intentions for investment, promises and commitments, believe it or not, 
a part of GDP. And now there's the question of nominal GDP versus real GDP. Inflation, the rise in prices, automatically raises GDP because GDP calculates consumption, includes consumption, and consumption is how much we pay for products, goods, and services. If the prices of products, goods, and services go up, we pay more. The more we pay, the higher GDP. So in a way, inflation is good for GDP figures. The higher the inflation, the higher the GDP. That is why we adjust GDP to inflation. We deduct inflation from GDP figures, and we call it real GDP. Unfortunately, it is the government which decides what coefficient to use, what deduction to make, and it is called the GDP deflator. GDP deflator is a highly political, subjective uh, number and subject to government manipulation. Then there is the issue of exchange rates. You can, as a government, you can play with exchange rates. You can choose a specific exchange rate or choose another exchange rate to minimize imports, to maximize exports, to minimize outflowing uh, currency, to maximize incoming currency, and then the conversion creates more dinars, which inflates the GDP figure. So, using the right exchange rates can change dramatically GDP, actually by up to 2%. GDP figures also include all expenditures on healthcare, all expenditures on agricultural subsidies, and all forms of aid to the population or to specific professions or to specific fields of the economy. In other words, the more generous the government is by giving out subsidies, by financing health care, by helping students, by providing all kinds of assistance, the more generous it is, the higher GDP. So governments, as you can see, have huge influence on the outcome of the GDP figure. They can heavily, uh, I don't want to say manipulate, but heavily tailor the GDP figure to feed their needs. Many governments don't even exclude extraordinary items, privatization. If a government sold an asset, a state asset, a state company, a state-owned bank to outside investors and received $500 million, this should be considered an extraordinary item because it doesn't happen every year. But some governments count it in the GDP figure. Most governments in the world actually count remittances, payments by people expatriates, people living outside the country, who are sending money back to their families, doznaki, remittances. Remittances, there is a debate whether they should be part of GDP or not, because they fluctuate, they, de they depend on external factors, and they are not really produced within the country. They are not part of the GNP, the gross national product. So there's a debate about this. In Macedonia, remittances amount to 15 to 20 percent of GDP. One fifth of GDP is money coming from the outside sent by Macedonian citizens to their families at home. Now that's not a small part of GDP. So how do we, how do we find out what is the real GDP, by how much it re is really growing, and so on and so forth? Well, we have what we call GDP proxies. When GDP grows, other measures of the economy also tend to grow. For example, electricity consumption. For example, believe it or not, mail, the amount of mail sent. For example, the wages of urban unskilled workers or fluctuations in purchasing power parity. When we analyze these proxies, we get a good feeling, a good intuition, whether the official GDP figures are right or whether they're a bit, how to put it gently, customized for the needs of the government. An analysis of these numbers in the Macedonian economy shows that the economy has been growing, exactly as the government says, but perhaps not by as much as the government says. Now, the government is bragging that Macedonia is the second fastest growing economy in Europe, uh, but that's not uh, very difficult. Europe as a whole is not growing, so it's very in the land of the blind, even the one-eyed man is champion. When you compare Macedonia to countries with a similar economy, to what we call emerging economies, Ma Macedonia actually is not growing well. 
the average growth in emerging economies in the world in the past 10 years has been 5% annually. Macedonia is far from that, even by official government figures.